Hey folks, thanks for coming. My name is Andrew Signer. I'm a software engineer at Buoyant. Um, I'm here to give this talk with my friend Frederick. We kind of wanted to showcase Linkerd and Prometheus and how they're complementary technologies and kind of show off the latest and greatest features, but also talk about kind of the origin story of, of how these tools evolved, how we ended up with these features, and kind of how the integration between the two developed along the way. Uh, so with that, uh, Frederick Brancy. Okay, so um, first uh, we want to have a look, quick run through uh, Prometheus. Um, quick show of hands, um, how many people know about Prometheus? Awesome, I think that's like 90, 95% of the hands. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, but specifically I want to talk about a couple of features um, that make it such a great fit for Linkerd and Prometheus. Um, but First, uh, let's talk about uh, some history just for, every, for everyone to know where Prometheus came from and how it developed over time. So um, Prometheus was initially created at SoundCloud by um, a couple of ex-Googlers who knew some systems within, uh, within Google and they liked it, but there was nothing out there. Uh, and so they created, uh, they knew Borg within uh, Google and there was Borgmon, um, which is the monitoring system. And sadly, nothing, is named uh, in the open source um, after the Borg or um, anything in Star Trek, unfortunately. I, at least I'm sad about that. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so, so they created this. And uh, today, um, fast forward like five years since they uh, publicly started speaking about it, um, a ton of com companies are using it. And I just saw 95% um, of the room like, like raised their hand that they know about Prometheus and maybe another quick show of hands, how many people are actually using it in production? Okay, okay, that's probably like 60, 70%, so that's great. Um, and I'm hoping that maybe the, the, the gap between the 95% and the 70% um, are going to be running Prometheus after this and we can add your company to this slide. So uh, let's start with a really simple intro uh, to how Prometheus works um, on a really um, basic example. So Prometheus is a pull-based system. So in some regular interval, it will go to your application and grab the metrics that your application exposes. And it just does that via an HTTP call. So um, we just have an HTTP endpoint on our application that exposes these metrics. And we instrument our application to whenever something happens uh, to increment, for example, our, our metrics. And Prometheus comes every 15 seconds, that's the default, uh, but it's configurable. Um, and whatever our application returns, we add the timestamp to it and write it into our internal time series database. And in this case, our uh, process hasn't actually received any traffic itself, so the request count uh, was zero, but now, we're actually routing production traffic to it, and over time, it increases its metrics internally, right? Um, and so, for example, now we have two requests that were hit against this um, service, and Prometheus, the 15 seconds have elapsed again, so Prometheus comes around and scrapes the metrics and inserts it into its time series database. And Prometheus just does this forever and eternity, and um, this is essentially the example of a single time series from one target. Um, and we'll keep reiterating on this terminology to guide us through this talk, basically. Um, so what we just saw was collection of time series data. But Prometheus is a monitoring system. Now, what does that, what does that actually mean? For something to be a monitoring system, at least in my point of view, it means that we need to be able to do something actionable um, with that data that we're collecting. And I think the best, um, best example of that are alerts. So if there's some uh, condition in our system, then we want to get a page, for example, or a Slack notification or something um, that tells us that, there's a, that, that something's off in our, in our infrastructure. And uh, I just want to show that there's really nothing that's like, black magic in Prometheus. Like we saw that the collection is super simple. It's just every 15 seconds it goes around and collects all these, this data. So that's really simple, right? And alerting um, is really 
the exact same thing. And you see this throughout the Prometheus uh, code base that really everything's like super crisp um, and just pretty, I, I don't want to say stupid because it's, uh, it's good, but it's stupid as in uh, it's uh, simple to understand. Um, so yeah, this also just happens every 15 seconds. Prometheus just evaluates all the rules it's configured to evaluate and then if an alerting rule is firing, then it will actually fire that. Um, but now we're at KubeCon, uh, so what does that have to do with Linkerd and Kubernetes and Prometheus, all the CNCF projects? Um, so Prometheus has built in service discovery uh, mechanisms for Kubernetes, and what that means is Prometheus can go to the Kubernetes API and ask for all the pods in your uh, Kubernetes cluster, for example, and that way Prometheus then knows, okay, I have this pod, I have this pod, um, and uh, goes ahead and scrapes all of those uh, individually. And this is a really uh, subtle but re very important thing, which is Prometheus is about white box monitoring, and that actually does mean that we do go to every single pod and want to grab metrics from every single instance. We don't load balance this or something because then we would be getting metrics from different processes every time um, we scrape our metrics. We actually wanted the we want the granular targets to be scraped and that way we true, have true insight into our applications and how every single process is doing. And then we can do aggregations over our entire infrastructure and make sense of all of this data. So this is really important when you think about Prometheus, we always want to make sure we get data as close to uh, the origin of um, some action. So if we are talking about a network service, we always want to have the instrumentation as close as possible to the code that actually um, does um, the network requests. So um, let's visualize this a bit. So we saw previously we had like a table where we inserted all of our timestamps, uh, but it turns out uh, time series are actually nice for graphing, right? Um, so we have a couple of samples here and we have a metric called uh, HTTP requests. That's a really common thing uh, to have. Um, but Prometheus um, has a model where you can basically enrich all of these metrics with additional meta information, uh, which is label, which are labels. And in this case, um, for example, uh, we don't only have one series for HTTP requests, but we have lots of series describing different aspects of our HTTP server. So we can have, for example, metrics based on request paths or on uh, response latencies. All things uh, like that are totally possible with Prometheus. And we'll see later how uh, that's great with Linkerd. Now, um, Prometheus was created at a time where there was no Kubernetes. And uh, at the time, um, the, the engineers looked at how, uh, what is the lifetime of uh, a time series. And typically, things were deployed on virtual machines, for example, and uh, all processes uh, even if they were restarted, they would be restarted on the same virtual machine and everything would basically stay the same. So that means that our time series were, were always continuous. We didn't have lots of time series that started and stopped. Now this changed, changes dramatically uh, on Kubernetes um, or even on cloud providers that sometimes start to um, evict your virtual machines or stuff like that. Um, so we will, it, it's super important that Prometheus um, is purposely built for an environment like this. And this is what we did um, when we created the Prometheus 2.0 uh, storage. We specifically had this problem that there were lots of pods coming and going in Kubernetes, and that meant there's, there are a lot of time series that keep being created and stopped. Um, and to make that problem even worse, people like insight, and that's a good thing, but it also means that it's that much more data. So the more labels we have, the more time series we're going to produce, um, the more load we put on Prometheus. And essentially the most costly operation uh, is creating a new time series. Um, you can roughly um, compare that to creating a new file that's relatively expensive, uh, compared to appending to an existing file. That's a pretty cheap, or, or at least comparatively, uh, a very cheap uh, operation. 
So, um, what's our situation? We are in a world where uh, targets come and go all the time and they expose hundreds and thousands of uh, time series at a time. So, uh, when we realized this in Prometheus 1.x, uh, we just thought we completely had to rethink uh, everything that we did because one of the, ex the um, key things in the Prometheus 1.x storage was that every single time series was a single file on disk. And if you think uh, about millions and millions of active time series, that, also, that translates to millions and millions of files on disk, which some file systems are not even particularly happy about uh, us doing. So, um, we completely rewrote the entire storage engine. Um, and the problem is not just inserting this data, but then people also want to do queries, all sorts, all sorts of queries. And basically, we have an, a visualization here that shows uh, we have all sorts of queries where we uh, slice and dice uh, data, and we want all of this to be fast, right? And uh, all of that is possible with Prometheus 2.0. And uh, another cool feature um, that we, I think, is pretty unique about Prometheus in the space, um, because Prometheus is pull-based, it can immediately detect if a time series goes away. So if our slash metrics endpoint um, had metrics for some path information um, and that went away, um, then we can immediately tell in Prometheus on the next scrape that this time series has stopped. Now, this is not particularly useful for uh, HTTP requests, um, but if you want to have, for example, in the Kubernetes case, we often have that pod information comes and goes all the time, and we want to be able to tell that the pod has disappeared immediately. Um, so stay on this is really how, do, how can we tell that a time series is done? And previously in Prometheus 1.x, uh, this was just like a timeout-based system where if a time series hasn't received a new sample within the last five minutes, it's marked as stale. But that's problematic because that means that it potentially takes up to five minutes for uh, alerts to actually register that this time series is done. So that's too late. And in Prometheus 2.0, what we did instead is um, immediately when the, um, we, we have some tracking functionality and immediately when the time series disappears from the endpoint, we immediately mark it as stale. Um, and this is a really nice property of Prometheus being a pull-based pull system because in a push-based system, this is not really possible unless the pushing target also knows when it ends time series, which is kind of difficult to do. Um, and this is really great functionality and it actually made us discover a bunch of problems in the Prometheus ecosystem because um, this is, this is an, an example of C-Advisor, which exposes metrics about uh, containers. Um, and there was a bug that wasn't actually, that, what, that was causing C-Advisor not to actually continuously um, expose metrics, but um, just have gaps every now and then. And in Prometheus 1.x, this looked totally fine. We have continuous lines, everything looks happy. Um, but in 2.0, with correct, or better staleness handling, um, we immediately noticed that there could be a problem. And as I said, this is super important in order to be sure that the data that we're looking at is always fresh. And um, even if you uh, go out of the talk uh, not remembering any of the, uh, the things that I've just said, then uh, just remember basically this slide. Prometheus, a single Prometheus server can get you really far. Um, and we've seen in the, in the wild, in actual production systems, that uh, Prometheus is ingesting uh, over 700,000 samples a second. Prometheus is capable of doing more. We've done this synthetically. Um, but this is like one of the, um, an example in the wild that we've seen that real uh, production uh, in real production usage. Usually, people then start to split up Prometheus by uh, responsibility. So you have one class per Kubernetes cluster or per namespace or something like that. 
and uh, 700,000 samples per second roughly tra translates to a 350-node uh, Kubernetes cluster. That, of course, is like a generalization because it depends on which uh, metrics you collect. But 350 nodes Kubernetes cluster is already, uh, you can already run quite a lot of workload on that. And now we'll see, uh, with, we'll hear from Andrew how, it, how all of these features in Prometheus makes, make Linkerd that much more awesome. All right, thanks a lot, Frederick. Um, so yeah, what I'm hoping to do is kind of walk through a similar history of, of how Linkerd evolved. There's actually a lot of parallels with uh, how Linkerd 1 and then 2 evolved uh, along with Prometheus. Um, so to give a little bit of a, a, a background, so Linkerd is an open source service mesh for cloud native applications. What, what does that mean? Um, so service mesh is a term for uh, a layer of software that provides security, reliability, and visibility uh, to your microservice architecture. Um, and so there's typically two components of it. You have a control plane, which is really like the operational view of what's going on. So that's, that's a place where Prometheus would live. Um, you collect metrics. Uh, it gives you some kind of a user interface, either through a dashboard or through like a, a command line interface. And it, it's, uh, it's talking to, it's providing service discovery to your cluster, and it's also gathering metrics. Um, the other side is the data plane. That's typically a proxy that's running as a sidecar next to each of your, your pods or your, your containers in your, your application. Um, so to back up a little bit and, and kind of figure out, like, how did we get here? Linkerd's origins go back to Twitter in 2010. Um, at that time, it was probably the largest Rails installation on the planet. Uh, the summer of 2010 was the World Cup. Uh, every time Brazil scored a goal, Everyone would treat Go, and uh, the site would crash. And so we were frantically trying to decompose this thing into microservices. And we found that every service kind of needed the same thing. It needed security, visibility, and reliability. And so we factored that logic out into a library called Finagle. It was a Scala library, which is still um, used probably in every microservice at Twitter today, or virtually every service. And it's, uh, it's gained pretty good acceptance uh, across the community. I think even SoundCloud maybe uses it. Um, and so it was great. We found it very useful. Um, the drawback was since it was a Scala library, you needed to be writing a Scala application to take advantage of this kind of thing. Um, so that was kind of the inspiration for building Linkerd. What Linkerd 1.0 did is it took this Scala library and wrapped it into a proxy so that any language, any fr framework, uh, you could be running locally, you could be on Mesos or Kubernetes or whatever, you could take advantage of this like service mesh concept uh, and it was agnostic to like what technology you were using. So about a few months after we released Linkerd 1, uh, we started getting requests for integration with Prometheus. And uh, so we, we added this endpoint, as, as Frederick mentioned. Uh, Prometheus is a, a pull-based system. So all we had to do was expose this nice little metrics endpoint on Linkerd, and then Prometheus could go around and collect metrics uh, from all the Linkerd proxies running on your cluster. Um, at the time, uh, that's kind of all we provided. We started building up some examples, some uh, kind of reference designs on how do you plug Linkerd into Prometheus, and we realized that those reference designs started getting a lot of attention, needed a lot of support, and, and that, that kind of motivated us to start thinking about a tighter integration between the two. Um, and so fast forward to uh, about a year and a half ago, and we started thinking about Linkerd 2, and, and we kind of made, made the jump to, to do like a complete uh, from the ground up rebuild. And I'll, I'll walk through a few of the motivations for that. Uh, one was the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, the like, excitement around this community is insane. Like the, the crowds in these rooms is, is wild. Uh, and so while Linkerd one kind of, you could run it anywhere, um, that was great, but the, the downside is it made configuring it super complicated. You know, you had to uh, come up with a, a pretty complex config file, and, and it was not like an easy out of the box set it up and go. And we're gonna we're gonna see how Linkerd two does that. Um, so targeting specifically Kubernetes made configuration like orders of magnitude simpler. Um, next, we wanted to include Prometheus as a first class component. So rather than walking people through plugging their Prometheus into Linkerd. We'll just give it 
to you uh, fully integrated. If you wanted to bring your own Prometheus, you totally could. Uh, it's all open source, but, uh, but out of the box, we just wanted this stuff to work, and we'll see that in a minute, too. Um, the other pieces were which technologies did we choose. Scala served us really well for a long time, but uh, you know, when you're trying to run a proxy on next to every pod and people are like, you know, writing little tiny services in Go or whatever, and they take up 10 megabytes of RAM, and we're asking you to install like a, 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 a JVM process that requires 200 megs of RAM to run right next to it, that's not really acceptable. Um, so for the control plane working in the Kubernetes ecosystem, Go seemed like a natural choice. The, the community, there's, there's a lot going on, and it plugs really nicely into to all the Kubernetes tooling. Um, on the, the proxy side, we made a bit of a bet, and we, we went with Rust because we wanted that native performance, but we also wanted kind of the, the safety that we were used to from Scala. Um, and I say it was a little, bit bet, a little bit of a bet a couple of years ago, but I think it's proved out pretty well. We've gotten uh, great community support, uh, and we, we've even hired some of the members of the community and to, to work on libraries that, that help support the Linkerd proxy. So just super high-level overview of, of how it works. This is kind of that same diagram you saw a minute ago um, with a control plane and a data plane. And you've got your, your Linkerd controller, that's the go side, talking to Kubernetes. Very similar to how Prometheus works. It's getting all the service discovery information. It's telling uh, the proxies where all of the pods are. And then next to every pod in your, uh, in your cluster, you've got a little Linkerd proxy running. And uh, that thing knows how to intelligently route to uh, different pods in, in your cluster. Um, so this is a really similar pattern. Um, as I said, Prometheus is a first-class component of Linkerd2. Uh, it's set up to also listen to Kubernetes. While Linkerd is doing routing information based on what Kubernetes is telling you, Prometheus is doing collection, as Frederick mentioned. So it goes and asks Kubernetes, where is every Linkerd proxy running? And then it goes out and it collects data from every Linkerd proxy and lets us roll up that information. And because that proxy is responsible for every request in and out of all of your applications, you can get everything from request load, latency, success rate, uh, you know, Linkerd is protocol aware, so you can, you can get things that are HTTP or HTTP2 specific or gRPC or whatever you're using. Um, a little bit more, if you just want to introspect the, uh, the metrics themselves, we also include our Grafana. Um, that was another lesson. Like People kind of wanted all of this stuff integrated together. So if you're familiar with using Grafana in Prometheus, like if you install Linkerd, you will feel right at home right away. That stuff will work out of the box. And then to administer that control plane, we also include a CLI and a dashboard. And we'll, we'll kind of run through some of those tools in, in a moment. So I'm going to attempt a bit of a demo. We've got a really basic uh, app made of three microservices. It's intended for managing your bookshelf. So you've got a front-end web app, and you've got a book service behind it and an author service behind it also. They're talking to a MySQL database. Um, each of the three microservices has three replicas, and uh, we'll kind of see how, how they all interact. Um, we've got a traffic server that, or a traffic like instance that just is meant to you know, put load on the system just to make the data interesting. We'll also look at the books app from a browser and make sure everything's working. And then we'll also deploy like kind of a chaos monkey script that'll start tearing it all down and kind of demonstrate uh, how uh, Linkerd and Prometheus handle that. You know, uh, Frederick was, was mentioning churn and you're in this orchestrated environment, things are coming up and down. Uh, how do these tools perform when that's all going on? So the first thing I'm going to do is deploy a, uh, my books app. So if that all went right, I'm spinning up nine pods plus like something for MySQL plus a, a traffic server. So we're just going to take a peek, peek at it really quick. Okay, so here's our books app, pretty simple. You can click on books, you can click on authors, you can edit things, uh, you know, pr pretty basic stuff. Shout out to N.K. Jameson, fifth season, good book. Uh, so that's, that's kind of that. Um, now we're gonna do a quick install of the control plane. As I said, like Linkerd1 was super complicated to set up, 
when I want to install Linkerd2, I should have mentioned I'm, I'm using a Linkerd2 CLI that I've installed. Um, if you're familiar with kubectl, you'll feel right at home. Uh, it's got tab completion. It's got a, a bunch of commands. You interact with Kubernetes objects the same way uh, you would with kubectl. So if I want to install it, I just run Linkerd install, and I pipe that into Kubernetes. And if you want to kind of get a look at like what that's doing, you can just type Linkerd install, and you can see this is the, the YAML for the, the control plane. And if I wanted to look at the different options, you can set, like, there's same defaults and all of that, but of course, like, it's super configurable. If you wanted to set different ports or edit the YAML yourself, like, you're, you're totally free to do that. Um, so if we kind of wanted to look at all the components, everything gets installed into a, a Linkerd namespace. So we can kind of see everything that we just put on. You can see the, the four components of the control plane. We've got our controller, Grafana, Prometheus, and our front end web dashboard, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. And uh, if I want to make sure that everything came up correctly, we've got a check command that, uh, that you know, boots up and checks that all of the different components of uh, Linkerd are up and running. So if you install Linkerd and something's weird, this is the first thing we will tell you to run, and it should give you a nice little report on uh, what's going on. So we're good. Um, so next up, I want to show you the Prometheus that's inside uh, the, uh, the Linkerd uh, namespace. So let's take a look at that. Port forward, service, Linkerd, Prometheus, 9090. So for those familiar with Prometheus, this is, uh, you know, you should recognize this. Um, the interesting part is how Prometheus is configured to collect metrics. Uh, the two jobs I, I want to point out are the Linkerd controller. Those are our control plane, like, uh, like Go components that we're collecting metrics from. But more importantly, we're collecting from the Linkerd proxies that are running inside the control plane. So we use Linkerd in Linkerd. Uh, we have all of these Rust proxies that are running uh, in, inside the control plane itself. As you start to deploy Linkerd into your apps, that list will grow. And you'll see Prometheus start to pick up the proxies running in each of your apps. Uh, so now I want to show you the, the Linkerd dashboard just to kind of give, you can do all of this from the command line, but it's also nice to just kind of be able to browse around and see all the information. So you can see here, we're getting metrics on the control plane components, and this is the same way that you would get metrics on your, your own app, which you'll see in a minute when I inject into the books app. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you just want to uh, use Grafana and talk directly to Prometheus and click around and, and see things like success rate, request rate, latency, um, it's all here, and uh, we'll, we'll dig into this a, a little bit more. But yeah, the, the, kind of the point was like, this, this all comes up like, you know, with, without a lot of uh, setup. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to inject uh, Linkerd proxies into the Books app. So let's just kind of make sure that the Books app is still here. I can still click on it. It's still running. Nothing up my sleeve. Uh, so we're going to uh, take that Books app uh, YAML that we had before, and we're going to pipe it into a Linkerd inject command. And all that's going to do, and then we'll pipe that into Kubernetes. And if I kind of want to look at what just happened, it took our application YAML and injected several Rust proxies into it. Um, the app, if we did this right, uh, didn't, should not have gone down. Um, you'll see some pods are spinning up, other pods are, are coming down. But the app should continue to work uh, without, without issue. So I, I can refresh it. I can still click around. And uh, everything continues to work. Um, so if I go back to my dashboard, if, uh, if, if things worked as expected, I should start to see um, some uh, telemetry information of, that, of the Books app that I, that I just deployed. And you can see we're already getting success rate, uh, request rate, latency, all of that stuff. Um, and I can click into like a Grafana dashboard again and see all of the same information for this book service. So um, if you take away nothing else from this talk, um, in addition to the 700,000 requests per second for Prometheus, know that like without changing your app at all, you can run a Linkerd inject command and get metrics like this for free without doing a single thing. You don't have to tear it down. Um, we specifically targeted Linkerd to run in, in a number of different environments. So even if you're not a cluster operator, you, you can't even create namespaces. You you can still install Linkerd and inject it into like your own namespace that you have control over. To dig into a little more data, if I wanted to look at uh, stats for all of uh, 
all the things that are running. Uh, here's my different deployments in, in the Books app. I can also do it over namespaces. Again, if you've used KubePedal, you'll recognize all of these. If I wanted to filter from one deployment to a, uh, from maybe all deployments into, let's say, the author service, I can do that too. So again, uh, really, we, we try to make these patterns uh, very familiar. We also have a tap command that allows you to tap into every request that's running through the system. This isn't like tailing a log. This activates a gRPC connection and starts streaming data from the proxies dynamically. So it's only doing work when you're running the tap command. And you can obviously filter this uh, a bunch of different ways to kind of identify requests that are, that are flowing through your system. If you want a, a slightly more rolled up version, we have a, a top command. That'll give you, it's a lot like top on your laptop, but it's like a top for microservices. So it shows all of the, uh, the requests that are, that are uh, flowing through, but in a rolled up way. Now, Frederick mentioned earlier the, uh, the, the cardinality issue with Prometheus. It can ingest a ton of stuff, but it's not really appropriate to, um, to abuse it as far as, as putting a lot of uh, different time series into it. And you can see here, like in this list, some of the requests we're seeing have path information. And, uh, uh, a URL that includes like author slash 168.json, like that's not really appropriate. If you have thousands or millions of objects in your database and you, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be right to like record metrics for each one of those. So we need a way to kind of roll that up. And I should kind of jump back and say like the motivation for this talk started in a, in a tweet uh, almost a year ago when we announced like kind of our first uh, beta version of Linkerd2 at the time we called it Conduit. <laughs> And Frederick very politely uh, replied and said, I'd like to talk to you all about your, uh, your Linkerd story. And, and uh, he's really provided some awesome guidance on kind of creating best practices integration with Prometheus. Um, so part of what came out of that was uh, fixing that cardinality problem so that we can kind of get metrics in a, in a well rolled up way. Um, so inside my books app, I've also got a bunch of uh, Swagger documents that describe the APIs um, of each service. And with a new Linkerd uh, profile command that, that we've recently added, I can convert that Swagger document into a CRD that Linkerd understands and then pipe that into kubectl. I'm going to run another command over here just to kind of demonstrate what's going on as I'm deploying these, uh, these CRDs. All right, cool. So there's a Swagger document for the books. The author service, I'm going to do it for books. And for the web app. Okay, so we already see that our metrics are starting to get rolled up in a way that is aware of our APIs, um, which uh, you can get here. You can get, if I jump over to the, the Linkerd dashboard, I should be able to drill into you know, the deployment of my author service. I can kind of see what's calling it, what it's calling. Um, here's kind of the exploded view of all the requests, but then here's the nice rolled up view that's, again, aware of... Uh, of like the design of my API. If you don't have Swagger documents, you can define these CRDs yourselves. Um, it's, it's pretty flexible. Um, the last thing I'm gonna deploy is uh, a Chaos Monkey script. So so this is going to, I mentioned we have three services with three replicas each, that's nine pods. This thing is going to randomly pick a pod every 10 seconds and, tear, and just tear it down. Um, so you'll start seeing the pods bounce up and down. And kind of the, the point in how Linkerd and Prometheus integrate with Kubernetes is that because they're getting real-time information from, uh, from Kubernetes, your, your applications should continue to work okay, and your metrics information will continue to be like, uh, will be continuous, uh, correct, and real-time. Like, uh, as as Frederick mentioned, having like a five minute timeout when your, your pods go away isn't really, uh, it's, it's a much better model to kind of know out of the box, uh, you know, when things are bouncing up and down and still get consistent metrics across that. Um, so quick shout out to, um, oh, I, sorry. I just wanted to uh, call out really quickly all the things we just did. 
And uh, hello, computer. OK, we're going to look at it like this. Um, so I ran a linkerd install command to install the control plane. I ran an inject command, didn't change the app at all. We used stat and top to kind of get information about, about what's going on. We ran a dashboard command to give kind of a high-level browsing overview of it. We looked at Grafano and Prometheus. We ran a profile command to take advantage of, of Swagger. And we ran a routes command that gave us API-aware statistics about our, uh, about our application. Um, so again, quick shout out to the Linkerd community. Um, it's been in production for, for over two years now. We've had over 100 contributors. There's 2,500 people on our Slack channel. Please come and join. Ask us questions there. Ask us questions at our booth, all that stuff. Um, so on behalf of Frederick and I, thank, thank you all so much. Questions? Do we have time for questions? Okay. There's one question. So, good question. question. No, sorry. Yeah, the, the question was, can you get things like like OS and container level information? Um, you can do that with, with Prometheus and Grafana. That's part of Linkerd, or you could install it separately yourself. Linkerd is really con concerned with the request level metrics, but we have variations of Linkerd that have Prometheus configured to gather that kind of information. And that's totally something that you could take that Linkerd install YAML and edit yourself if you wanted to. I think it would be up to you whether you wanted to do that in the observability stack that's in Linkerd, or you could do it uh, in kind of your own stack. It's, it's really your choice. Okay. Sorry, say that again. Uh, yeah, so the, the question was, can Linkerd kind of be your one-stop shop for TLS? Yes, we have. When I ran that install command, um, there are flags to turn on TLS, which will uh, use TLS between all of the proxies. We're working on things like ingress. That's coming soon. Um, and we're working on in, including like, like a full CA. So it's kind of in progress right now. But you can try it out uh, if you download the latest version of Linkerd right now. Yep. Go ahead. Over here. Good question. So the question was, do you get uh, Zipkin? So the Linkerd1 uh, supported Zipkin. Uh, Linkerd2, we, we decided to, to drop support for it. We felt that we could get like about 90% of the benefits of tracing by just having metrics about what's calling what. We can kind of build your call graph and, uh, and give you tracing-like information. But if, if you really need something like what Zipkin does, where you get a request and you need to see that request transit through all your microservices, uh, you'll need to configure Zipkin separately to do that. OK, right here. So best practices for using Linkerd in really large clusters. Let's say I run a cluster with 1,000 nodes, yeah. hundreds, nine, thousand namespaces, yeah. hundreds of applications, and so on. Yeah. How many instances of Linkerd I need, and how do I split applications? Right, so you can, you can deploy the control plane uh, with a flag that says how many replicas of each component you want. Um, so th that number like, depends on, on all kinds of like, performance, uh, but it's, it's designed to run in an HA configuration. So if you, if you encounter performance problems with the control plane, you can just scale up that replica count to accommodate your cluster. Oh. Group of developers that group of developers that if you want to, I can spin up another for, for Okay, that's a good question. So it, the question's around 
um, how could I split up my Linkerds if I, I have a certain set of concerns for a group of applications over here and another over here? Um, when you run that Linkerd install command and the inject command, you can specify which namespace you want to be concerned with. So um, you can deploy n number of completely independent Linkerds in different namespaces, and when you go to inject a proxy, you can decide which Linkerd you want that proxy associated with. And then when you're seeing these dashboards and all those, those metrics, they'll be totally separate. Um, for, for the most part, we've configured Prometheus to, to work very specifically for Linkerd's use case. We don't hold on to metrics for very long. So uh, generally, we, we'd say, for as far as Linkerd's metrics are concerned, you can run that Prometheus uh, like part of, part of Linkerd. Um, if you wanted to run it, it's your own. You totally can. We have a documentation on our website on how to do that. So I saw you. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, say that again. Um, so uh, the question was, uh, is there like an integration story with the Prometheus operator? Um, so for the most part, yes. Um, the specific configuration that Linkerd um, ships out of the box um, uses the vanilla Kubernetes, uh, Prometheus uh, configuration, um, but there's nothing stopping you uh, from using the Prometheus operators here, these two model the same thing. It's just not default. Sorry? Right. You could, as, uh, as Andrew said, that uh, you can totally run your own Prometheus, and that could be through the Prometheus operator to be used uh, by Linkerd. I mean, at the point where you run your, uh, sorry, the question was, can, can you use uh, federation in that kind of um, setup? Uh, at the point where you uh, run your own Prometheus, you can do whatever you want, right? Like, the only, uh, the only thing you need to be careful about is that uh, you basically use the configuration that Linkerd uses, and then you can do things like um, sharding uh, based on that configuration, which is something that Prometheus supports. And then you can do federation, or you can use something like Thanos for horizontally scaling everything. Um, th yeah, that, all of that is totally possible. So when you do uh, Linkerd in inject, you injected a sidecar with the security policy of NetAdmin? Yes. Yep. Okay. So the question was, um, someone astutely noticed that uh, one of the containers we inject uh, with the proxy uh, requires net admin privileges. What's going on there is we have uh, two pods. One is the proxy itself. The other is an init container. Those init containers are changing IP tables to, to manage that. We have an open ticket right now in the Linkerd repo to support inject without uh, a net admin privilege. Um, I don't have all the details for it, but it's, it's in the repo. It's open source right now. You can take a look. And if you have particular requirements, like search for net admin in the repo like, and, and comment on the ticket, please. So, so the question was, uh, have we looked at configurations of, of Linkerd that uh, run kind of per node rather than as a sidecar? Um, that's, it's, it's interesting. Like, Linkerd 1, that was kind of our default pattern. Um, and so it's something you, you could configure Linkerd 2 to do. We don't have a lot of reference designs on how, but um, it is something that we're looking at. So everything you saw uh, online is, is available and open source. So uh, obviously, like Linkerd is, is totally open source. You can see all of it. Uh, we have a Linkerd examples repo that shows a lot of the examples I was working through. And if you just look for like buoyant books app, uh, you're going to find that the books demo. You could run through everything we just did. Uh, yeah, totally. This was all like self-contained Kubernetes on the laptop. Okay. I got a question. Uh, does it, I mean, Linkerd 2.0 is 
doesn't support like a network enforcement policy like in the ECO and can I make a like TLS uh, connection between service A and service B? Yeah. Because so this is what I, I, I couldn't find on the documentation because that's I right. enough there. I tried to play around one zero to zero one zero, but they couldn't find it. Yeah, so the question is, does Linkerd 2 support uh, network policies? It does not today. It's on our roadmap, and it, it's a... I have to rely on CNI, like a Cilium or Coleco, and do it in a little... For now, yes. It's definitely something we want to support. We just, we very intentionally been releasing uh, a smaller set of features and trying to get those production ready and then expand, but that's, that's on a short list. Yeah, uh, what about TLS connection? So, so far, I can it make, like, service A and service B speak with the right... We we do we do support TLS connections between between the proxies, so you can turn that on. But it's we have a lot more work to do there, particularly for ingress. So um, again, there's probably open tickets in the Linkerd repo to uh, to like we're gathering requirements for right now. So please please take a look in there. Yeah. Okay. Go. Cool. One more. Um, I, I don't, I know we have, there is some like Helm charts out there that support installing Linkerd2, I believe. Uh, I, I haven't worked on them, but um, if there's an open ticket, I definitely recommend commenting on it. It's something we do want to support as kind of a first class way to install it. That's right. Yeah, there and we, sim, similar issue. Uh, we've recently added a community member added uh, auto injection capability, so you can install your control plane like through through Helm and then set everything to be auto injected, and then anytime you deploy an app, it gets proxies for free. So, yep. Cool. Okay. Thank you.